my AO. It's been a long time since I've been here. It feels like it anyway. Um, yes, coming to you with this neck brace on. Uh, some of you may know, others of you don't, but I basically had a disc replaced in my neck and I had two other discs fused. So we're kind of working through all that and that's why I had to postpone last week. Sorry about that. I wasn't quite ready. Um, this is as ready as I'm going to be right now. Hopefully by the next mentor session I'll be out of my brace and all good to go and uh, we'll know if the healing has taken place. Um, my name is Shelly Merrill. I am from Ventura, California and I own a fire protection company um, here and we do a lot of contracting with the government and many commercial um, industries too. So I am here to answer some questions and hopefully you guys will be able to get some uh, I'm trying to see who is who is watching. Hi Robin, I hope you're doing well. Um, so I'm going to see if I can get you guys any value out of this at all. <clears throat> so my first question is from Lysandra Wilson. Hi Lysandra. I like seeing all of your posts and, and information. That's cool. The question is, what are sales strategies you would use to market your baker dessert services in a local area? Background is, she has a custom cake and dessert bakery and trying to do more weddings and events. Uh, I want to move into creating dessert bars tables for events instead of lots of small cakes and dessert orders. Do you recommend cold calling, email, emailing as a way to connect with other businesses and vendors? If so, what tips do you have to be successful in doing so? If not, what other tips do you have for reaching out to other businesses as a way to build your business and hopefully reach new clients? I thought it would uh, be helpful to cold call email venues and event planners to start the process of getting my name out there and building rela relationships with them as previously most of my business has been word of mouth which is great but not quite my ideal client anymore uh, and that's families with small children so um, Lissandra this is a really cool question and I um, I think there's a lot of different ways you could um, get your name out there and drum up more business for your desserts. Um, a couple of things I would do if I was doing this. First of all, I would invest in getting uh, some really great professional pictures made of your products. Your actual, you know, set up an actual dessert bar, get some really good pictures and stuff like that. Then what I would do is put together some sample packages and take them to particular customers that you want. Um, for instance, Amazon has been big in this area lately. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work for them, but they've um, built and developed a couple different big, big warehouses here. So if I were doing that, I would actually take a sample package over to them and um, uh, I'm not sure, maybe uh, HR, might be HR because I would want to uh, promote it as something maybe they could do or provide to their employees for monthly meetings or however often they have meetings. That might be a good way. Uh, you might have some other big vendors in your area that you would want to hit up by uh, giving them samples and seeing, you know, kind of going from the from the angle of, hey, you could provide this as another thing to your employees if you're having employee lunches or any of that kind of stuff. Um, but samples, pictures, uh, I always recommend to everybody to join your local chamber of commerce. Um, you know, actually, if you join the Chamber of Commerce and end up at a meeting, take a take a sample basket with you with cards attached and all that good stuff or flyers or postcards, however you're going to end up doing your marketing. Those are things I would do. Um, there are a few other members in this group 
that come to mind that would be really helpful with this. I recommend, if you haven't already, uh, connecting with Michelle Adams. Uh, she's been very successful with her bakery and has a lot of really great ideas. So that's a connection I would definitely make if I were you, Michelle Adams. Um, those are the things that I would do um, a as a starting board, mainly getting those pictures out and then hitting up those big corporate clients. Um, you never know where that could lead. They may, they might start. Those employees might start placing personal orders with you. You just never know. Um, so anyway, keep us posted on what you end up doing. I can't wait to see. Um, and if you do pictures, I definitely want to see those. So keep us posted. Okay, the next question is from Melinda Clark. Uh, should I rent a brick and mortar office space? Uh, the background is I'm a nurse practitioner with a health and wellness practice, which is a small start startup side gig, still not very established. I'm primarily offering concierge home services right now. I keep tossing around the idea of having a brick and mortar location, uh, thinking it might be somewhat easier to market. Of course, that comes with more overhead expenses. I definitely have some fear around this and biting off more than I can chew. To mitigate some of this, I all, I'm also considering, if allowed in the lease, subletting part of the other space to other professionals who offer services that complement but don't compete with mine. I plan to reach out to the landlord of the space I'm interested in this Friday to get more information. So, Melinda, my first question to you is, would it be at all possible for you to buy a small location? so that that asset is um, under your control and you're not leasing it from somebody else? That would be my first question. Um, and if, if you were able to do that, could you buy a big enough small space that you could then lease out some of the other um, uh, offices or property there so that making that income could then pay your mortgage payment? So that's just something I want to throw out there. I'm a big proponent of building assets. Um, I follow Sharon Lecter's guide on that and um, w would be interested in hearing about that. As far as going for brick and mortar as opposed to concierge, I'm wondering how that might bog down the home concierge portion of it. Say, for instance, you have a brick and mortar and you start getting booked with patients every day, every hour of the day, this and that and the other, is, that's going to affect your concierge home service. So um, I question whether or not if that's a direction you would want to go based on what you want your focus to be. If you want your focus to be that you're going to somebody's house and or seeing them virtually, I'm not sure you might be seeing them virtually too, um, how would that affect, because you can't be in two places at once. So um, those are my questions about that. Because, uh, yeah, I could see that turning into a, a good business over here as it as an office having patients and then a good business over here having the concierge or virtual however if you're going to their house or if you're seeing them virtually I could see both of those developing into something bigger which is fine as long as uh, you're able to then hire those other nurse practitioners that can service that that much so those are things that I would be thinking about if I were you and I hope that helps. Uh, sorry, just reading the note from Robin. <laughs> I can't see it very well, Robin. I'll answer you back afterwards. Um, the next question is from Ashley. I have a hard time with this last name. Latourno. I hope I said it right. Ashley Letourneau. 
I have 3,000 square feet of open mat space to use during the day, trying to figure out how best to use it. The uh, business description is, I'm partnering with my coworkers at the Martial Arts Gym, and we are trying to bring in different revenue streams, use the facility to its full potential. Right now, it's empty from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. It is an A-plus prime location in a wealthy neighborhood right off the highway in the same plaza as Costco. That sounds like a really good problem to have. Um, if I were you and I was trying to figure out how to use that space, I would be thinking of yoga instructors, being able to have yoga classes there, dance classes there. Um, I used to go to belly dancing and we would go into a studio like that and do our stuff, you know, for an hour. It was so much fun. And then um, what about senior citizens? If there's um, somebody who wants to do a senior citizen exercise program, those are options that could possibly help you get that space filled during the time that you're not using it. Um, those are just a few. If I think of any more, I will um, send you a, a message. But those off the top of my head are things that I think could actually work um, even Monday through Friday, especially the senior citizen thing. Oh, or also um, children's groups. Um, if there's any daycare center around or something, maybe they want to come and do a, a dance party or, you know, I, I don't know. It's just um, an, another way that... that might bring you income. I'm not quite sure if kids groups that might not have been the best suggestion because they make a mess. But anyway, there you go. There's a few anyway. Okay. And so I don't have a lot of questions this time. So this is my last question from Kristen Pitts. What is the goal and timeline to start paying yourself an income out of your business? Background, I am in need of help setting up a net profit goal structure to follow. I am in the apparel wholesale business. I am a startup. I just had my first test market and this next upcoming season will be my first true season in business. I am investing every penny into my startup and have no issue continuing that for as many years needed. I want to lay out a timeline and goals to look forward to. A rough outline if there is one. Thank you so much. Um, Kristen, that's awesome. Uh, in my particular situation, I'm a corporation, and so I pay myself as an employee. And there's no difference, no variation. Um, but what I'm always doing is putting our, our net profit back into that. If I were in your situation, I... If, if I could continue to be investing in the company without taking a pay, I would keep doing that. But um, as a general guideline, I would say it all depends on your net profit. If your net profit is, say, uh, $50,000, Say your, your bottom line, your net profit is $50,000. I would pay myself $25,000. I would, I would take half of that. Um, as long as all the bills are paid, uh, the income is still growing, um, you always want to have a net profit. You don't want to have a net loss. Uh, it, it, it's far as in the eyes of a bank, um, if you ever need to borrow money, if you have any kind of a net loss, especially because you paid yourself money, they look at that and and, and it, um, it gets factored into their decisions. So do your best to avoid having a net loss. And um, if you can afford to pay yourself, start doing it now. You could always... Um, put that money in or put half the money into savings and then if your company hits a, a downturn you could loan your own money to your company if that makes sense. 
So I think those are some ideas. I, I don't think anybody has a general rule of thumb that I've ever heard of. Um, as a corporation, I have to treat myself as an employee, like I said. And um, I would just always be looking at that bottom line. Um, it doesn't matter what your top line sales is if your bottom line um, net income or loss is a loss. So um, feel free to reach out, ask any other questions. I'd be happy to give you my opinion or my input or my experience. And um, that is all of the questions questions for today and I hope you all are having a fantastic week and continue to have a great week and weekend. Take care.